All right, we are live. Hello and welcome to Product Lessons, a podcast channel where we talk to product leaders from all over the world and learn from them how they build and grow great software products. The podcast is available both on YouTube and Spotify. Just search for Product Lessons in both these medium and you will find us. I am thrilled to have with me a thrill would be understatement actually <laughs> i'm thrilled to have with me krishna panikar he is the vp of product at, at airbase uh, krishna is a product veteran for for years he enjoys uh, enormous influence in the product community i have been trying to get krishna on my podcast since like past 4 years but eventually he agreed today so very very thankful uh, to that i have benefited immensely from his product uh, wisdom we have uh, shared notes we have interacted we have called each other a couple of times and uh, very very thrilled to spend the next 90 minutes or so to talk uh, and uh, geek out on some of the product topics he has worked in companies like microsoft blink quest bank pipe drive and now airbase so with that let's welcome krishna krishna welcome to product lessons how are you doing today Hi Ravi. No, thank. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. <laughs> I'm great. Uh so Krishna, um you just joined Airbase not just it it is 5 months now. Time passes like I it just seemed like uh, I still remember your uh, LinkedIn post on your day 1. Uh but 5 months has passed. How how do you think you have uh, how how has your early days been because this is something that most product leaders be very mindful of on how their early days on an organization is right so how how did yeah. you uh, plan your first early days and set yourself for success at at uh, pro- uh, in in a new company yeah so you know it's it's just 4 months now uh it feels like a year <laughs> a lot has happened in that time uh but i'm lucky so um you know my my boss is uh, Tejo he's a ceo and so we laid out what what good what success looks like after um for the first 90 100 days and so it's been a really interesting journey i was i i was uh very fortunate because Tejo in the first few weeks even he would spend every day so he would make sure you know we laid out a plan of what we would do for the first uh four weeks i laid out kind of a plan what i do for the the latter two to you know for up to 90 100 days and the goals set there uh but what really helped is the onboarding in the first i would say couple of weeks they was were very very crucial any opening questions i had i was able to kind of resolve them very very quickly and he's just kind of let me loose since then um but it's been great so i've been very much focused on um really three areas you know looking but uh uh of what well, one thing is just understand, understanding the the product and domain space because uh, actually I've not done fintech prior to coming to airbase so just learning this whole space has been fascinating for me um learning about the product itself obviously um the people understanding how uh how uh, the team works and operates what works well what doesn't work well um the uh the way we prioritize uh it's very key so looking at our priorities and um, our mechanisms to do that and then just overall processes right so thinking about um the processes we have in place not just within product but uh typically cross team typically processes within a particular department generally work quite well uh it's uh, you often find the gaps occur in between so I've been looking at that as well so uh when i kind of did that analysis i've i've been really focused much more on process and um and priorities uh because those were the areas that i uh i felt had um had more work right bigger bigger gap and uh, an area that i could um bring about change more quickly got it would, would that be all the three together or you go um do do they all go hand in hand like or do you like focus on uh, people first or processes yeah first? so the first thing i do is just um classic product right i just do the diagnosis so i i just do an assessment first of where what is the state in these areas and then uh where where should i based on that assessment where should i pay more attention 
So that helps guide me to understand where I should put that effort. And you, you also mentioned talking to your CEO, uh, identifying what success looks like. Yeah. Um, does it depend upon the context of the company for every company that you join? Like what does success look like? Would be immediate, would be uh, midterm and long term, isn't it? Yeah. So um, uh, definitely it's, it's, it, it changes case by case. Actually, in Airbase, it was pretty straightforward <laughs> because uh, Tejo, for all intents and purposes, was the head of product, right? You know, he, he was the, the very first person. He'd been doing all these customer interviews from day one. In fact, before day one, right? He's been doing a lot of the discovery work. So uh, he has been the head of every department from day one, and he's slowly been... Um, uh, giving away that responsibility over time. And so one one of my jobs is to make sure I release his bandwidth entirely. I wanted to make sure he had peace of mind, quite frankly. That's the emotional state that I wanted to at least bring, is he right. just has peace of mind, that he can just uh, pass this to me and he can just get on with the other priorities in the business. Uh, so uh, that that was with all the tasks we talked about, right that was the key outcome that we i wanted to get to is at least i know that uh, he has that uh, peace of mind um, and uh, and that the rest of the organization sees me as the first point of contact right so i wanted to establish that obviously there are a whole set of activities that got us to that point but uh, that was the outcome i focused on how uh, big is airbase do you want to just share about the company a bit yeah, sure. So we're at around uh, two. I might, uh, you know, I might be out a little bit here, but around two seven five in terms of number of employees. And uh, and they did not have a head of product uh, till till now. Is that how it does? Yeah, it was. It was Tejo. <laughs> he <laughs> nice. he had you, you know you. Uh, back in the day he was the head of sales. Head of marketing, head of product, and wow. yeah, yeah. So, but but you had a product team. Um, we, how, how yeah, absolutely, product? absolutely, okay. yes. How, how yes, big is the product? Team? So the product team itself is around again, give or take, around uh, twenty uh, PMs, a little over wow. twenty PMs. Wow. Around ten designers. Uh, we have a product ops team as well. Um, and actually, I discovered as I joined, <laughs> there is, it's not part of product, but um, uh, I manage, a, you know, part of support is part of the team as well. So oh, nice. customer support. Excellent. Um, and um, I, since you joined a new organization, and this is a question that I often ask product leaders whenever they to join a new organization, the first 90 days, 100 days is crucial, right? So because you are interested, as you said, you you want the organization to make you as the point of go-to person for all product topics. Yeah. How do you, what are the ways to build that reputation or a strong reputation of the product function in an, in an organization? Yeah, good question. So the first thing, the first thing I do just very quickly, obviously, Tejo, you know, very early on, Tejo introduced me at the company meeting. So just the simple things of just making sure the awareness is there for everyone. Uh, I let people know um, what I've done in the past so they understand that I have a history that I can bring in, um, at least in product, not in domain experience. So I've been very transparent about that uh, with everyone that I'm, I'm, I'm learning there. And I find it a fascinating space. The second thing that I do is actually uh, share back information as I learn it. So the one advantage that I have in three months, in the first you know couple of months, three months, is uh, is actually my ignorance. Uh, so bringing my observations in, right? It's a very I can come in very objectively and say, listen, these are my observations. This is where I. This is what I'm seeing. Uh, has worked well. This is what I'm seeing uh, doesn't work so well. These are where I see the gaps. And this is where I believe we should focus. Um, so sharing that 
is also useful, just getting that fresh pair of eyes uh, on the business early on. And then uh, also doing that, I talked to you about the analysis of, you know, product priorities um, and process, actually sharing that back to the business uh, as I speak to different groups of people, um, sharing that diagnosis and um, identifying where we should focus. So really engaging with uh, all the key parts of business helps here because, um, you know, some some people don't always know what product people do. <laughs> I think we all face that in product, right? right? Even sometimes if you if you look to your circles outside of product, you know, friends and family, hey, what do you do? Not always, uh, not always well understood. I mean, uh, just to share a story with my with my my mum, right? I you know she knew I was the product manager at Skype. She didn't know what that meant. She knew I worked at Skype. And at a certain point, she used to use it a lot, right, to talk to family. And at a certain point, she said, hey, you're done, right? You finished your job. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, it, it works. It's, it's, it's great. Like, you don't need to do anything else. And I realized at that point, that's how some people perceive product. <laughs> like, it's uh, you've built this thing, uh, a bit like a, an Ikea item, right? You built this table. It's done. Now you go on to the next product. Uh, <laughs> and so some people may have that perception, right? I'm not saying everyone has that perception, but uh, one thing I do is really explain uh, what product does, how we focus on problems, uh, problem identification, uh, um, uh, not just coming up with a, a stream of ideas <laughs> and building a list of a backlog and so forth. So ensuring that people understand that we focus on problems, problems that have um, high willingness to pay, identify the right solutions that uh, fix those problems um, and ultimately make money, right, uh, for the business and uh, talk about the key levers of the business that we can influence. Got so it. I do that. I do that across the board. So just so that we can level set so people understand what we do and the impact we can have. Got it. Um, so, so when you join a new organization, you do this audit uh, and, and then you figure out okay where are the gaps in products and processes yeah and uh, you observe like a hundred things to improve right so how do you how do you prioritize on the most important things to work upon instead of hey disrupting the entire i mean the product has been successful things have worked in the past it's not like nothing worked obviously yes. there are areas to improve but how do you make changes without disrupting the apple cart and just focusing on the key things yeah that's a really key part ravi so being surgical in the changes because it's very easy to do making sweeping changes and you can get rid of the good as well as the bad right so um it's quite right to point out point that out so uh what i do in my case is um I really look at this from the, the point of view of what is the highest leverage impact we can make right to the business. And in some cases it's, um, uh, it's layered, right? So I'm going to talk more in abstract terms because every business is different. So you need to understand what are the foundational layers that you might need to change. Now I'll, I'll, I'll talk separately from maybe people and processes. Maybe I focus on priorities because I think that's how, a lot of people read your question about the priorities. Right. Uh, but I, I needless to say, you've got to make sure you have a good team in place. Make sure, yeah, you know, make sure you've got the right uh, people. Make sure that you've got the right processes in place. But once you get to priorities, you know, the first thing that I tend to look at, I have to say, is, uh, is quality. However you define quality. Um, because if you don't have uh, the, the trust from your customers, um, almost every other layer in the priority stack doesn't matter, right? If you start getting, if the, you know, the moment you get product market fit, you know, you're getting that word of mouth spread within that seg, that target market that you're uh, focusing on. And what spreads is the good and the bad. If you're doing a great job, that word spreads with that segment very quickly. 
And likewise, if things start flipping, if the quality bar starts going down, that starts spreading. So that's the first thing I look at is, hey, uh, let's just look at customer support tickets, look at MPS. Where are we right now? Because uh, often what you find is it used to be good and it tends to start like a boiling frog start to deteriorate. So making sure we set that bar. That's the first layer because everything else doesn't matter if you don't get that right. Uh, and then I start building out other layers in that priority stack of um, of what has a high impact. So I tend to look at, uh, you know, I work in a SaaS business. So I look at the levers of, hey, what's affecting our uh, lifetime value? What are the factors that are affecting that? What are the factors that are affecting uh, acquisition and win rate? All right. And uh, uh, what are the factors that affect our uh, channels and dist yeah, distribution channels. And so I tend to layer those up um, and w identify the areas um, that are working well in each of those uh, streams and uh, what has the, what will have the highest impact in each of them. And often, in fact, almost always, uh, the capacity you have will never meet the demands. So that's the other thing that I really try and reinforce in the team is, in some cases, let certain fires burn, right? There are, there are way too many fires. So focus on the biggest fire. Uh, and it's very easy to get distracted here because you often see the fire directly in front of you. Right. But there could, be, there could be a burning skyscraper right behind you that not everyone sees. So make sure you have people focus on the biggest problems. And let them be good with letting go of the smaller problems. Got it. So, so when you join a, a, an organization with a new industry and a domain, um, you obviously are a functional expert. How do you leverage institutional uh, knowledge to to come up to speed and set yourself for to success? Like, do you do you get into listening to us across the across the company? Maybe maybe some guidelines on how to learn fast within the company yeah um i mean i don't think i'll be telling anything new firstly in my diary i allow allocate certain time every single week to do this uh that includes customer interviews meeting certain key members of the team that have uh, the best knowledge um so typically the the longest tenured employees in um, the multiple areas whether it be support success sales marketing uh product the works um, really leverage that um, as much as possible. Um, speaking to uh, customers and in some cases, listening to prospect calls, if you have them recorded, that meet our ideal customer profile. Um, and you can very then very quickly get to understand the problem space. Um, <clears throat> and I, I'll call it that, the problem space, right? Because it's not just understanding the, um, the domain uh but uh, and you know i'll i'll make sure i'll i'll go on the appropriate training to get up to speed there but you want to understand the core problems that actually sit in that domain got it you, you say every single week like you block your calendars to to spend time on the problem space is that how it is do yeah. you could you could you reveal a little bit more on how the structure is like do you identify a certain area of your product and you say that okay this is this is a black hole for me, or this is my knowledge gap. And these are the areas I am least familiar. And I'm going to spend my next four weeks talking to the people and ensuring that I am at par. How does, how does the entire, how do you structure this? Yeah, what I do is, um, well, firstly, I start broad, right? So early days, I'm just, uh, it's a fire hose, right? So you're, <laughs> you're trying to take in as much as possible. And then as time goes on, I start mapping out the areas where um, I see the biggest deficit in my knowledge. And then I really try and ensure that I have my learning fill those gaps in. Um, and I can, again, I use various techniques to do that. So um, it might be that I spend more time with a couple of people and ask, ask help in that area. It may be an area that they're more familiar with. Um, and it might be that I, uh, on the flip side, uh, uh, get recommendations of which customers should I talk to uh, regarding 
this particular space. And I either speak to those customers or go back if we do happen to have a recent call uh, with a customer slash prospect in that space, um, I listen into that call. So we use, for in our case, we use Gong. So we have um, recordings of some of these calls. Um, you and, used uh, what? Sorry, I, I we use a an, and we use a product called Gong, G O N G. G O N G. Um, never heard of that. Uh, oh yeah, you look into it. Yeah, it's a pretty big product uh, for sales teams, especially. I see. And uh, you get a, you then pick out certain uh, call recordings, mm. uh, and uh, it's a very, uh, very neat way. I mean, sales typically use it to learn about what works and what doesn't, but so it's also great for product to, to dip in uh, very quickly into some of the problems that our customers are having and understanding the, the uh, objections and the issues some of our customers are having. Nice. And and when you speak to uh, these colleagues of of yours, uh, do you like go to them with a list of questions uh, to answer, and then it's just a Q and A, or how is it? Yeah. So the first time, typically, the first time I might meet someone, I'll keep it short. I'll, I'll I like to keep it relationship focused, meet and greet. Right. Um, I typically then follow up if I need to um, with uh, maybe a more firm agenda, saying love to catch up. And these are a couple of areas I'd love to focus on. Got it. Um, do you also impart the same um, structured learning also to your product teams? Because I'm sure the product managers, the, the lead product managers, uh, would also want to have a same kind of a learning need, isn't it? Do, do you also push push them to, to do the same? Because I remember in, in some of my best organizations, my product, um, head would ask us to block our calendars to talk to these cross-functional teams and also to support teams and also to the customers. Yeah, so, so but that came that came up more in the diagnosis. So yeah. you know, I'm really fortunate that uh, my team has been they're really customer obsessed. You know, they they are frequently speaking to customers, so they have a really good sense of the problem space for our customers. Um, but where there have been some gaps is around uh, the conversations with support and um, and the quality of conversations with some cross-functional teams. And so that's where um, I, I've asked for more focus. Got it. Right? Um, so I, I do that. And you know, when I when I made my observations in the analysis, that's where I saw some of those gaps. And we highlighted is that as a... Uh, um, uh, let's call it alignment tax, right? To make sure we're all aligned, we've got to make sure we're having these conversations. And so we now have created more of a rhythm to make sure we have those uh, processes in place. So we're um, uh, far better aligned across the organization. Got it. So so with this rigor of talking every week to these different uh, sources of information, how does that translate into action? So do you do you do something concrete to as a takeaway from all these conversations absolutely so um uh like i say in the, in the first i would say in the first few weeks it's a fire hose of information and uh what i tend to do is as quickly as possible i try and translate that into how we we need to think about um each of these areas and especially on the priorities piece think about where should we defocus right a lot of people talk about focus <laughs> they talk about what we should what we should focus on a lot of it is about what should we stop doing sometimes mm -hmm. uh because uh, capacity quickly drains because uh, typically focus means can you just add this onto your plate as well <laughs> <laughs> for some organizations. So I want to make that really clear. Let's do less of one thing and more of another. And so that's what I look at is what can we what can we really um, uh, make clear in terms of outcomes for the team? All right. Is it is it around increasing our customer satisfaction score or NPS? Right. Is that the biggest gap? 
Okay, if it isn't, what's the next layer in the stack? Is this about improving? Again, I'm, you know, I'm talking from a SaaS perspective. I look at each la layer of the stack, right? Is you've got the retention piece, that's one layer, right? Decreasing churn. You've got um, increasing lifetime value, I would say, um, is is another piece about increasing ARPA, ARPU. Um, another layer is acquisition or in win rate. Um, and you have another layer of um, uh, distribution uh, as well, which is uh, maybe, you know, is there anything in product we can do to increase top of funnel? So I want to really connect the problems we're solving for our customer right. with the levers of the business, the key levers that we're trying to influence in the business. Right. And then uh, do you like, it's been five, five months already for you, like do you then take ownership of the vision and then uh, create or realign the vision and share it? Have, is that one of your deliverables, the vision for the next two to three years or something? That's right. Yes. So uh, it's been it's been four months now, and uh, uh, that's actually uh, the piece that I'm uh, going to be sharing actually uh, this this week uh, sure. uh, with the team, uh, and ensuring that you know we've I think we've had a really good um, way of working. Um, in recent times where we have teams set up um, of product design, engineering, uh, product marketers as well that work in the squads and they really focus on their problem space. And that's been working very well. And so uh, quarter by quarter, we make incremental uh, moves for each of the personas that we serve. And so one of the areas that I've, uh, I've have been doing some tweaks and alignment on is around the vision strategy. What are the what are the high order impact moves we can make over the next two to three years, um, so that we're not just making uh, additive changes quarter and quarter, but one of the things I'm looking for is multipliers. What are the things that we can do that multiply on top of each other quarter and quarter, and that typically needs a you know a a, a real quad a cross squad alignment to make those changes because they're typically not easy <laughs> to to make those changes because you're talking about identifying these high leverage items and swarming on them as a collective and that's where vision and strategy becomes key this is uh, this is the meatiest piece uh, till now <laughs> i would like to double down on that one um sure. so 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 you are saying focus not just on additive changes but multipliers and that needs overall broader context you cannot have multipliers without with, with siloed thinking right correct. Um, correct and by the way i should be careful here right because everything i'm talking about makes sense post product market fit i think pre-product market fit i think it's quite different actually i think pre-product market fit um you should be absolutely obsessed um around the uh, actually these customer discovery piece. Um, but post-product market fit, that's still true, but the the market discovery piece becomes forgotten, actually, and that needs that uh, collective insight, <clears throat> not just a squad insight. Got it. So b before I ask you about the multiplier, do you want to simplify the definition of product market fit? Because many, I mean, we all have a vague idea of product market fit because and the reason it is vague is there is no definite point of time where you say that oh we have achieved product market fit but what are those check boxes that one needs to tick before one can confidently qualify a product to have achieved product market fit yeah um i mean this this is an endless endless discussion actually around product market fit i mean what i will say um, you know, and I think it's um, Mark Andreessen talks about, you know, it, you know it when you see it, <laughs> right? But uh, the question I ask myself is, if I'm in marketing and I'm looking at CAC, you know, co uh, cost, you know, customer acquisition cost, right. and uh, LTV, 
at what point am I going to throw, put all my chips in and start uh, scaling the business, right? Because there's a certain point where you get a, a relatively um, efficient uh, cost of acquisition versus LTV. And at that point, and you need to decide that on each business needs to decide what that right point is. Uh, but at what point are you going to put your chips in and go, right, let's scale this. We've nailed this. We understand the market. We put this, uh, we put this uh, solution out into the market uh, place and we have a, we have good appetite for this. Uh, but now we need to scale this. Now we need to ramp up. Uh, we need to ramp up our um, acquisition and distribution and so forth. Uh, and each business needs to determine what that right level is. But, that's in a very simple terms. That's how I think about it. Uh, what point have you uh, are you serving the market needs um, to the point where you're going to scale? All right. Um, I'll keep it broad like that because I think uh, uh, if I look, you know, I come from I, I I've come from both B two C and B two B, and right. the way you assess that can can differ depending on uh, the sector that you're in. Sure. Um... Yeah, we'll keep it at that. So um, very, very, you said about high leverage items, and this is something that many, uh, especially the young uh, product uh, leaders struggle with, and uh, they are primarily looking at simplistically uh, working on a bunch of uh, features uh, with, with a simple value versus effort uh, priorities, and just pick the initiatives that have maximum value and value could be a, a lot of lot of different uh, dimensions but how do you how does one think about multiplier effect the high leverage items maybe some light on that would be helpful yeah sure so let's think back to let's p think back to the day you know as a you know when i was an individual contributor and uh, you're right. You know, you tend to look at return on investment. You think about, hey, this is the benefit, right? And this is how much it's going to cost me. And uh, in the early days, those those ROIs tend to be quite big, right? You find these relatively big rocks. It's like a really big problem. There's a high willingness to pay. You solve it, and you see you see like a nice uh, increment, right? You really are unlocking massive value. And then over time, you see that that uh, there's almost a half life, right? So as you as you're discovering new new problems, you tend to find that um, the increment gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And over time, you know, especially as you're being successful, by the way, you, what you find is teams, rightly or wrongly, they tend to focus on the uh, denominator, like how much is this going to cost us, right? And so often you're looking for these quick wins and you, you run out of quick wins after a while, right? right? Uh, and that's when you've got to be careful, right? Because you can exhaust that quite quickly and you get a plateau in the business right. over time. And, um, uh, and, you know, by this time, you would have, you've probably gone past product market fit because you have actually solved a pro certain problem. You're scaling it now. You're trying to multiply that across that segment. But if you want to now unlock the next layer of value, if you need to remove certain barriers. And those barriers are hard to remove when you only look at this on a team-by-team -team basis. If you've got teams doing discovery independently, then um, you're, you're going to very quickly squeeze all that value out. And so you now need to look at um, not just customer discovery, but market discovery what are the new insights you can really pull out <clears throat> and you can do that by uh maybe uh talking to and there are various ways right so <clears throat> one is actually think about having not just a customer research ethos but a market research ethos you might actually want to spin up a market research team <clears throat> at the very least work with uh, market researchers to understand and assess the market, uh, identify white spaces that might exist in the market. There are different mechanisms to do that. Probably not going to go into that now. But uh, but you can also look through um, some of the data 
that you have within uh, sales. Actually, there can be a mine of data. You can see, well, what are the patterns that we're seeing? Where are we losing our sales? Why are we losing those sales? <clears throat> and it might be that there are adjacent markets, adjacent personas that no one's spoken to. Maybe there's a new persona that um, you sometimes start bumping into, you know, these new personas that start looking at product, but it doesn't quite uh, quite match their needs. So maybe there's a whole new space there you, you can open up. So under identifying what are the adjacent markets, what are the adjacent uh, personas that you can tap into to unlock that new uh, new layer of growth for the business. Um, maybe you want to do some analysis uh, with non-customers as well. <clears throat> do the research with non-customers to understand what the opportunities of growth there or like I say, with personas within the customer set that you already have. There are new personas there you could tap into. What, what do you mean by non-customers? Uh, so I mean that uh, you have a, a real focus uh, after, you know, you tend to focus on your customers, right? As, you know, that might sound, uh, that might sound almost a contradiction. Of course, you focus on your customers. But there's a problem with that. If you just talk to customers, you you end up with an echo chamber after a while, right? Because you speak so much to your customers that you're only serving their needs and you're not serving the needs of this new layer of um, uh, new cohort of, of customers uh, and non-customers that might, that could uh, rise up. So for example, this might be a group of people that could find um, uh, that could find your product useful if it was made more accessible to them, if it was simplified for them, if it was tailored for their particular needs because they're a slight, you know, they work in a slightly different vertical or they work, uh, actually they have a, a different persona, right? So maybe you have a product targeted towards marketers and if you tweak it slightly to work with uh, BDRs, or if you to work for sales or to work with more head of marketing, not just the marketers themselves, that you can expand um, uh, the TAM of your product. Right. And so those I see as non-customers because they're customers that are, these are potential customers that, uh, um, that you could grow into. Got it. The other thing that I wanted to um, I always have reflected is product will never have the bandwidth to have all these conversations, all right? Because I'm always struggling with the split between execution and discovery. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it depends upon which season of the product you are in because sometimes the entire focus goes on execution and firefighting mode. Um, and But even if you have time bandwidth, you will never have enough to do all these um, conversations outside. So as a result, you need to deeply de depend upon the sales folks, the business development folks who do this day in, day out, out in the field, talking to customers and bring these great insights. Um, and I have seen uh, that young product leaders take immense pressure that they need to do all, all by themselves. And... Mm -hmm and see this as a lack of influence if they do not gather this firsthand and go and take it from the existing, um, from other functions like, like sales and marketing. How have you leveraged the, as, uh, the internal wisdom from, from, from of these uh, sales people? Like, do you, have you uh, given them complete freedom to give you context that whenever they see something insightful, they come and tell you, and they could also offer their wisdom on how some of these multiplier effects could work. Because I have seen great ideas come on the high leverage topics from the sales. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of things on that, Ravi. So one thing is I do think it's important that as a product team, we do need to be out there doing the most um, impactful discovery that we can, right? Even if, you know, it's very, very easy. And this is a whole other topic to be, uh, to be honest, Ravi, this overwhelm that most product people feel is this overwhelm is often this energy that we 
that we are expending and we don't often feel the progress that's being made right. from that energy expended. And so I would really audit where that energy is going, really ensuring we're focusing on the most important things and letting go of other things. This is the thing that most product people struggle with is letting go. Because uh, <laughs> if you see a fire, you want to put it out. Um, and uh, my ethos is actually no. In some cases, let that fire burn. Mm. Right? That is not an you, easy... You don't need uh, to put out every fire. Is that, you is can't that put out every fire. So mm. if um, if someone tells me, but look, I have customers, um, I, I have customers that are feeling this pain point. And then we map out the capacity that we have as a as a function. And we then look at all the problems. Right. Let's focus on the highest and the, the most impactful problems that our customers have. The fact is, there's always a problem. <laughs> there is always a problem, right? And we need to focus on the ones that have the highest impact. So which, as I mentioned earlier, like which which is the biggest fires? Which are the biggest fires that we have? Focus on those. Um, and that is not a comfortable feeling, right? You don't, no one just walks away from a, a, a burning house, okay. but you should, if, if there's a, like I say, if there's a burning, if there's a, <laughs> if there's a burning, uh, um, building block, which has even more people in, um, so that is an, that is equation that never matches. Our capacity will never match the number of problems that we see. So that's the first thing is really focus on the most important things because that really helps with the overwhelm is letting go. And, and it's easy to do that, by the way, when you see that visually, when you see all the problems and map that out and go, okay, at least we recognize all the problems because that's the other part of overwhelm. I'm not answering your question just yet because I want to deal with that overwhelm piece is like time is often the uh, that overwhelm occurs because people don't have visibility of all the problems and when they once they start mapping it out they um, actually can let go of some of these open loops that are in their head that don't allow them to sleep at night <laughs> right so actually mapping that out and being very cognizant of that okay once we get that past that point um, i would then argue no let's let's start eking out some time so we start understanding the problem because if if product don't understand the problem space then that's the problem that we need to solve first, right? And uh, it's not going to be easy, don't get me wrong, but we do need to make sure that everyone is spending some time. You know, it might be just two hours a week, four hours a week, but really I would encourage, um, uh, you know, a percentage of time per week where we capture those collective insights. And probably when we want to be smart about it initially, it's like, let's map it out. Let's say, listen, you focus on this set of personas i'll focus on this set of personas you focus on this market you focus on this vertical now going back to sales you're quite right so sales i i see as a really important ally because they are on the front line talking to prospects talking to uh in the sales of in the case of support and customer success talking to customers every single day right and um and so really having them point out to you that, uh, you know, Chris, Rav, you, you should follow up on this. We feel this is a big pain point here. It is great. You've got to be careful, though, not to be driven by solutions. Uh, you want to be driven by the problems, right? So sometimes I see that uh, if it's not managed correctly, we have teams that are giving you just a list of feature requests. And uh, we can get locked into that. What I what I find more useful is asking the question: What problem is that solving? Is that the most impact? Is that the biggest problem that you're seeing? Is that the trend that you're seeing here? If so, by the way, can you share the data? Because I think that's a very useful piece. There is to avoid getting lost in recency bias. It's good to have this captured in one a CRM pro um, product. So if the sales force is using CRM, making sure they tag that data so that you can mine it to start picking out trending data. And right. two, a uh, customer success team, are they using a CRM or are they using another tool to capture some of the feedback, like with support? Really dive into those tools with those teams 
and ask for the you know really pick out the biggest themes that you're right. seeing there right and that's where our focus and the themes should be really driven by the problems that, that are being seen not solutions because ca- often sales success and even customers will say hey can you uh, ravi can you build this feature for us right, right. what problem are we solving for uh, and right. sometimes that's one layer right that's the stated problem layer Right. There's also through the conversations that you have with customers, there's a revealed problem layer where the problem reveals itself. Sometimes there is no stated problem. <laughs> Sometimes after a conversation, understanding what their workflow looks like, you realize that you can do things maybe 10 times faster. You can say, wait, you do X, Y, Z. You know, you could just do this, you know, that thing that takes you a week, you could do in 10 minutes. Right. They may not even realize that because that's just a habit that they have formed over time. So, yeah, I think both those angles are going to be very key. Um, Got it. Um, just, just going back to the multiplier uh, effect. Um, so, so it's not like one day you are having your shower and then you, uh, you get these opportunities joining in your head, right? Yeah. So usually it needs deep thinking. Uh, and, and and reflection, uh, which becomes very difficult if you are always in firefighting mode. So I just right. wanted to ask you: <laughs> Do you do you spend time in deep thinking and reflection? Like, do you block big chunks of time just to uh, uh, drool over a problem space or an area? Absolutely, yeah. So I, I there's no way I can do this without. So the one thing I do is carve out time of uninterrupted time. Right. So I, I favor, you know, people say, um, you know, that that whole piece around maker mode and manager mode. Right. So I tend to have certain make days. Time. Yeah. Make, make, make yeah. Time, manager time. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and I think of it as a mode. Right. Because I, I think it's quite hard to context switch between those modes. Mm. So to spend half an hour in a meeting and then a half an hour where I'm just going to write something up and then another half hour where I have a meeting. I don't right. know about you. I, fi- I struggle with that. So what I no. do is, is certain days, I'm just going to have one-to-ones. Other days, you know, so I, I, I actually have themes in, in my week. So for me, there are certain days where I focus on team meetings, one-to-ones, um, cross-team meetings, collaboration. And guess what? When I have a day... Uh, where I have no meetings. Do I always succeed, Ravi, in having a day where I have no meetings? Honestly, no. <laughs> but I can tell you um, that I have far fewer meetings on those days. You know, I, I leave those for emergencies only. Um, it's not easy, right? Because it, t- it means that there are certain days that are exhausting because they're just back-to-back meetings. But what that does is allows me to get to that point where often to get to that moment of insight it it takes more than half an hour often more than an hour sometimes more than two hours so having that uninterrupted time that block um, for me at least of three four hours is absolutely key so that's one tool is having blocks of that uninterrupted time and the other tool is using literally using different tools so you know, you might use Evernote or Notion or Confluence or whatever to write up notes. But actually, to access a different part of, part of my brain, you know, I tend to use um, tools like, uh, you know, so in my case, uh, you know, I, I have like a iPad here and I just pen and paper, right? Just start doodling, drawing, really start getting what's in my head out, right? And so I want to activate a different part of my brain. If I'm doing that that type of deep thinking, um, because it tends to be unstructured thought that you are trying to structure over time, um, and it's very hard to get unstructured thought using the same tools that you do for stru- uh, for structured thought, right? So if you're using Google Google Docs for structured thought, well, don't use it for unstructured thought. Then use something else that uh, may- maybe allows your brain to your mind to um, to uh, tap into some of uh, some of the insights that uh, you might have collected. Got it. And but also, while while having said that, you will never have the bandwidth to think 
think through the entire product stack? Do you also delegate some of this thinking to the product team saying that, hey, this is the piece that we need to solve. Please figure it out and let me know what, how, how you think this, this thing should be solved. Uh, strategically speaking, of course, each teams have their own features to build and stuff like that. But do you also delegate some of the bigger pieces to the product teams? Because otherwise you will also get uh, burnt, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think about it in layers, right? So um, you've got the layer that each, each PM works in their problem space. So my expectation is, you know, they typically are, but work on the vision and the strategy for their space, right? So if they're working with a particular persona, let's take, um, I talked about marketer earlier. If you're working with uh, um, someone who, I don't know, working with email campaigns, that's your persona. You know, someone who works in marketing, um, I'm expecting them to really do the analysis for that problem space and they own it. But there's a couple of layers that that it needs to fall within, right? And so the layer I need to own is, you know, the, the full product and strategy. So I try and map out um, all, all the problems that we, we have and uh, where I see these opportunities for growth and uh, map. And, it, you know, I might need to then rethink where our focus should be based on that. And so... Uh, there are kind of three layers. There's the, if you like, the the product strategy um, for the company. You then have certain layers that exist within that. There might be, um, as I think about it, this uh, different horizons of thinking. What are we doing in the short term, medium term, and long term to drive value? And so I might work with certain teams and certain people to uh, and delegate those pieces out and then the third layer is this piece around uh, the problem space having people think about the uh, strategy for the uh, problem space that they're working on and so all these pieces need to connect got it um so on the product vision and strategy is this something that the the product function completely owns. Uh, and the reason I'm asking this is ownership is again vague, right? So because when you're new to the organization, the product vision is is a shared responsibility with 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 the execs, with the management, with the CEO, right? Yeah. Um, but do you clearly state that you know I, as the head of product or, or the CPO or VP of product, own this? And you draw boundaries because the, the reason I'm asking this is interference into the vision, into the roadmaps by other functions, especially stronger functions who have been in the organization for long. How yeah. do you prevent uh, needless interference into something that the product team has worked hard on and the other functions might differ, vehemently differ with the opinion on how you think about the future of the product? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a that's a good one, Ravi. So one thing is, I think um, I want to differentiate with the term ownership versus um, how we um, how we actually bring this data together. So there's one thing is owning putting the document together, right? But actually, the exec team needs to really be bought into it. If they're not bought into it, then uh, it's it's not going to work, right? Because those differences will come out in the wash over time. So it's absolutely key that we get buy-in. And I don't think of it as a them and us here, right? So um, I think framing is going to be very key here because we can't have a situation where product are working in a black box and then you go round and you try and then sell it to everyone because that's where you start getting these brick walls right because then it's like ravi that's that's your thing that's not my thing that's yours they've got to feel like they they actually part own part contribute to this right um and so to do that i 
I what I tend to do is create the right framing structure, which is thinking about the goals first. What are, what are we trying to achieve here? Let's let's forget the vision strategy for a second. What are the actual goals that we're? What are the outcomes that we're after? And that is the area which you can use as an alignment tool. Right? Is let's let's you know fast forward. What what does what does our business look like in two, three, five years? Pick your time scale. Right? What does a business look like? What kind of revenue are we going to make? Um, how much of that is a uh, new customer? How much of that is um, growing the existing base? How much of that is moving to different markets? Like, what does that look like as a business? Right. And if we don't have a point of view on that, it is going to be very, very hard to then work back off that. Right. You need to work back from something. And so that is the first thing I would do because it's that is a much easier conversation to have. Not what are you going to build? Like, where are we trying to get to? Um, and so that's the first thing is have alignment on uh, the destination. What does is, what is good look like in X number of years? And, and this, that, this is a collaborative exercise where... This is definitely a collaborative exercise. And I would actually start um, with the CEO first, right. personally, is get their point of view on this. And, uh, you know, they may already have data they can share and then uh, do that as a as a one to one with the heads of each of the areas and then come together as a group, share that and say, this is this is what this alignment is looking like. We may need to do another brainstorm to get that sense of alignment. So aligning on the goals first. Right. Once we understand that, now we understand now we need to get to what are the levers that we believe we can move to make that happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And when, again, when I say levers, what I'm talking about business levers here. Right. So what are we trying to do? Are we is this about reducing cost? Is this about um, increasing, you know, moving to new markets again? Uh, so really understanding what levers we can start uh, pulling on more than others. And then uh, once we understand that. Now we can start getting into, okay, how do we make that happen? Right? So you've, you're starting agreeing on the goals. You start to agree on the levers. And now we start to look at um, the path to making that happen. Not just, you know, it shouldn't just be on the product side. I'm sure there are moves across other areas of business as well. But if you're a product-oriented business, um you know, that's where things typically start, right? Making sure we have a, a product that serves the market. So it's going to be much easier to get alignment of, okay, if this is about um, moving to, you know, making this up randomly, right? If we believe that there's a big opportunity to uh, move to new markets, we've assessed that uh, Brazil might be that market. Uh, we've now, we're now going to investigate and research the problem space for people in Brazil, these are the problems we need to solve to now to make that lever happen and to hit our goals. And so working backwards from those goals is going to be key because then that really frames the conversations. That, that really starts forcing the conversation from being, I think you should build these set of features to these are the problems we need to solve to, um, to have this level of impact. Got it. I'm I'm going to share something here on screen. Okay. And then the reason I am sharing this is because I want to have clear lines drawn. Because this, this sometimes this can be difficult. Where are where where should the lines be drawn, which is sacrosanct, which is the the, the other functions should not be crossing over. I mean, of course, this is not, I, I completely agree with you. It is not about us versus them, but there is a concept of collaboration and there's a concept of uh, in interference as well, right? So when you have a roadmap and uh, you, you did your best by collaborating with all the various stakeholders, mm -hmm. you came up with overall uh, objectives, mission goals and, and everything. And then you also collaborated on the strategy, but 
now that you have assigned the team, the product teams, they should be completely empowered to lead their own product roadmap, right? My point is, where does this lines get blurred or get firm where there is, it should not allow interference? Because what happens is with interference on the roadmap, on the feature yeah. level from, from other functions, then it kills the motivation of the team. It, they're disempowered and then it, it is, a, again, um, house of cards. It breaks down, right? Um, what, what, are, what, what do you think about this, uh, this topic of interference of other functions on, on the roadmap at the feature level? Yeah, so do you mind if we get specific on this, Ravi? I'm not sure how much information you're able to share, but it'd be good to go through a spe specific example. Specific as in your, the, 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 the product managers of individual teams, uh, yeah. they, they, they come up with a roadmap uh, aligning. Are you able to talk about the specific um, recommendations they've made? Um, I'm talking about features, okay? So for the next quarter, yeah. all right? So you have a quarterly planning and you come up with a list of features, all right? And uh, all the alignment discussions of what we what problems we would like to solve, what, what yeah. are the goals that for the next six months are clarified. Um, who Should the PMs be empowered to come up with their own roadmap aligning with these goals and strategy for the next six months on what problems? Or um, these... Uh, these features of the next quarter's roadmap is open for scrutiny from from other uh, other functions. Is my question? Okay, so the reason I was asking for specific example, I was trying to unlock what might be going on here, right? So I suspect if it's um, you know, what I'm, one thing I'm maybe picking up on is maybe a trust issue. By the way. Uh, but I, we can talk offline about this, right? Because the reason you start, the reason you start getting these kind of questions and uh, different points of view is, um, there, uh, these different points of view should really be, I, I believe, tackled earlier on. Is, is again, it's hard to get into this without specifics. But if the let's call it the sales team. Okay, let's let's call this an example with product team and sales team. If the sales team is saying we really believe you should do X, Y, Z, and the product team is saying, no, we should do A, B, and C. Right. We have an inherent problem here because if the right. sales, especially the leadership is not bought in and the right. exec team, um, then uh, you're, you're really not aligning the product we're building with the way we go to market. And that right. means we're just going to build, you know, we could potentially be able to building great solutions that customers will never see because right. we we haven't built that go to market motion to get it out there, right? And um, and so if you're asking me my point of view here is, uh, I I think there's uh, yeah I I think that we draw the line in terms of understanding the problem and being consistent with the problem um, across the different teams versus the solution that we build what do i mean by that so let's let's take uh let's again because i don't know your business that well <laughs> i'm just gonna no, it, it, so you can be the thing is it is not about my business it is not about um, <laughs> let, let this not be okay, about sure. my business or my company i'm talking about what are the guiding principles wherein you leave the 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 product teams to make their own decision and w where are the lines drawn where they uh, they should be and they, they should not be okay so that is that yeah. is where i wanted to have a guideline yeah so uh every team should own their own problem space absolutely but they need to get buy-in from all the other teams to make this work right because they what you're constantly doing is trying to demonstrate using data why we should focus on a certain area and if the team is not able to do that well we we have a problem, right? right? If the team is not able to demonstrate that they understand the problem, that uh, they see that these problems have the highest willingness to pay, that this is where we need to swarm, then we have a problem. And uh, it might be a problem in how we communicate uh, that uh, uh, that problem area. It might be a, a 
uh, it might be a situation we're not convincing people that the solution that we have is right. But uh, I think it's going to be, I think it's absolutely key that other teams like sales, marketing, other functions uh, get visibility um, throughout the whole process of, of the journey of us understanding the problem um, right. and the solution that we're proposing. But it is the team that needs to own that process right. throughout that stage. But if they're not getting the buy-in, then I believe that um, we need to fix that. We need to understand why is that. What's how does it, how does the uh, to be to be concrete how does the buy in process look like like i do not want to get into a, a sign off process okay that hey yeah, each of you need to sign off this next quarterly product plan that we have right yeah. so because then again because then there is of i mean it's again a vague 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 line here right because sign off is again you are letting letting the powers of the roadmap, the ownership of the roadmap to the other teams. Yeah. Vis-a-vis -vis empowering your product teams. Because your product teams, you, if you have done a good job in ensuring that the goals are clarified, the vision is clarified, the strategy is clarified, they absolutely know it, and you have trained them well to be masters of their problem space, then they should be empowered to come up with a roadmap, solving those, those goals, so those business yeah. needs. Instead of signing off, mandating other functions who say, yes, now we approve of this roadmap. So how do you, I know there's no single answer, but how do you navigate this dynamic? Yeah, well, one thing that I use is uh, data, right? So give me data that shows uh, that shows anything different here. And ideally, you've got the data from these teams, by the way. So one of the, re the the way I avoid this whole sign-up process is uh, all these teams are involved early on. So the sales team, the marketing, again, all these teams are actually involved in capturing some of this data so that it points to the problems we should focus on and it points to the solutions that we're building. And so if someone has a point of view and says, well, actually, Chris or whoever the, the person might be, um, I don't think we should do this, right? Uh, I think we should do this instead. Okay, show me the data that uh, shows that because this is the data that we have. Our data indicates that this is the biggest problem, that this is the goal. Our data shows that um, this is the uh, biggest impact, highest willingness to pay area that we focus on, that we have data to show through high fidelity mockups that this is a solution that works for them and they have a high willingness to pay for that. Um, do you have any other data? Because that hasn't come up in our research working you know, across the, uh, the prospects, customers, and your teams. That's what I would use. Um, I'm not looking for a sign off here. And if they, if they have better data, I want to work with it. Mm. Um, otherwise, if it's just opinion, not very useful. In, that's not very useful input at all. Got it. Um, how, how do you, as a product organization, product function, how do you uh, build influence and trust uh, across the organization? What are the things that you should be doing well to eventually build that influence and, and trust across? Yeah, so one of the things I try and do is, is try and be as transparent as possible in the process. So, you know, I talked earlier about showing how we work and operate. Right. Um, uh, that's that's the first layer. The second layer is showing the process and saying, "Listen, this is this is how we work. This is the the steps that we take to get to this." Because that's also also a very useful feedback to teams. Because often they don't know when when can I have when can I give you my input, right. and often they don't see that. So showing that transparency in the process um, is another layer of trust. They understand where they can connect. Um, with uh, different members of the team and the types of data that can that can sway and give influence, and um, uh, and then um, constant uh, playback to the different teams. So I I often encourage the teams to say, okay, as you get to each milestone, constantly share what's going on, and this transparency uh, it it starts to compound. Right. It's like 
you, you know, everyone understands how we gather information. They understand um, where they can give that input. They can also understand where they can tweak the process. So often we have checking points where we have retrospectives and say, hey, how can we improve the process? The process is never set. How can we improve it? So that tends to give a two, generate two way conversations, right? So that we're always uh, moving in the right, right direction. Um, yeah. How, how does product planning happen at, uh, like what, what are your favorite ways to, to, to do a robust, good and robust planning? Oh, wow. You know what, Ravi, that's a whole other podcast episode. <laughs> no, okay, actually... let, let's take it out. Do you, okay, let, let me be specific. Of course, I mean, these, each of these topics are, <laughs> and, and can be a separate podcast. Uh, is yeah. this? Do you do quarterly planning or it's a rolling planning? Got it. Right. Yeah. So we we have a quarterly planning process, right. and so we set um, typically set th- more more from a thematic perspective, set themes um, uh, for a quarter, um, and think about it as an investment portfolio. You know, what are the key areas we're going to focus on? in terms of um in terms of areas like uh keeping the lights on retention strategic bets tech debt understanding what those investment levels are on a quarter quarter basis and understanding what the themes are so that the right teams can swarm on the right problems got it so 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 quarterly excellent um my my next one was on um Okay, lost. Yeah, of course. CEO relationship. <laughs> I I reckon you report to the CEO. What is the yeah? So what are, what are the guidelines or the frameworks that is is best used to manage CEO relationship as a product executive? Right. So it's a it's it's a very important, if not the most important, relationship. Right. You have to have absolute trust in each other. Right. And so that's that's the first thing is that this this can't just be a transactional relationship. Right. It's very easy to get into status reporting. Mm. Right. <laughs> Where are we with X, Y, Z? This has to go beyond that. Right. Um, and so um, often the CEO is seeing things that, you know, their, their visibility might be broader than your visibility. And uh, in certain areas, and in other areas, it's the other way around. You know, you're starting, you're, you get to see things that this, the CEO doesn't get to see as well. And really having an opportunity to share those insights on both sides is very, very key. Like, what are you seeing that I'm not seeing? Right. And sharing that is, is, uh, is very important. I find that very useful. Um, because I, 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 at no point am I complacent enough to to think I have visibility of everything, <laughs> and so treating the CEO as another, if you like, pseudo PM, mm-hmm. like well, you're seeing things, you, you you're seeing things in a much broader than maybe some of the PMs that I have seeing, and that's important. Those market insights they can really help bring those market insights in. So you know, utilize them in that way. And likewise, reflect back to the CEO that sometimes they can um, unintentionally, by the way, you know, often um, often they can raise a problem and everyone can react to it straight away. Um, mm-hmm. But it may not be the most important problem at that time. So making sure you create visibility for the CEO that you bring their insights in and then you work out the right time to work on those problems, right? <clears throat> you can get a pretty unhealthy mindset if you're always focusing on CEO problems, right? You want to balance that out with what the market problems are and the customer problems that you see. Right. You, you mentioned about absolute trust. What are the actions that help you solidify trust? Well, one one thing that I do is actually just share once again, early on, I try and share the process. I try and share how do I take what I receive in this conversation? How do I actually pull that into the process, in, into the product process? Because right. often it's it's seen as, you know, in some cases, it, product can be seen as a black box, right? 
Right. So that's the one thing I want to avoid is this is not a black box. I want to be very transparent about when you come in with something, this is how we do it. I want to show them that uh, um, things get pulled in. I want to show that not just to, obviously to the CEO, but I want to show that to other areas like sales and marketing success support. I want to show them how do we process all of this input. I think that's a very key part of trust. And, um, and then the other thing is, understanding actually getting the ceo to share listen this is what success looks like for me these are the key goals that we need to achieve and having them share that um you know if things change in that in those goals that needs to feed back to you as quickly as possible so that they understand that the problems that we're focusing are aligned to these goals How does, uh, yeah, so, so I, I get that. So for absolute trust, you need to share your processes, make it transparent, clearly define what success looks like. Success for the product and success for your role, isn't it? For both, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. Uh, f f you know, I'm, I'm successful if the team is enabled to be successful, so... Um, a lot of what I'm doing there is, um, uh, quite frankly, removing blockers for the team, right? So if they have any blockers, a lot of what I'm trying to do is remove those blockers for the team. So uh, that's that that's what enables their success and ultimately um, the success of uh, the business. Got it. How, how's the how's performance conversation happens with your with, with the CEO? Like, do you come up with uh, clear uh, goals and 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 uh, deliverables? Because sometimes, as a VP of product, head of product, CPOs, your um, your concrete deliverables can be vague because it's not revenues, unlike sales, isn't it? Yeah. By, by the time your products start performing, uh, for the decisions that you took, could be like six months uh, long, sometimes longer, right? So the roadmap yeah. that you pushed. And the the outputs or the outcomes of the roadmap could be a long cycle, right? Uh, yes. How how does how does performance uh, conversations uh, happen? Should happen? Yeah. So I mean, this honestly, Ravi, this is an area that I've seen evolve, uh, and I think uh, different organizations struggle with this in different ways. The one thing that I would say is um, whatever mechanism that you have um, about having impact to the business you know some people have okrs um for example i think one thing that uh, I, I do is really try and lock on the goals like what are the outcomes that you're after right and once we agree on those outcomes and these tend to be outcomes that can you know actually last a, a reasonable amount of time you know whether it be in product you know, we where the impact that we can make versus product and set, you know, sales and marketing, for example, it tends to be a longer time frame, right? They're able right. to, they're able, their cycles tend to be shorter. So, sure. yeah. want to make sure we agree on what those goals are, and then performance, uh, we work back from that. Okay, if these are the goals that we're working towards, um, tie tie performance to our ability to to unlock those goals. Um, and so that gives us more scope to work outside of just working along a set of tasks, right? Because um, it might be that over the course of a year, we, we might have a set of ideas that we think will get that outcome, but we want to have flexibility to evolve it, right? So what do we want to do? We want to reduce churn by so much, or do we want to increase ARPA by X or Y percent? <coughs> right. So how are we working as a collective? Often... And that's the other thing. Often it's not just one team that can deliver these things, right? You tend to have to work across um, uh, multiple disciplines. So the performance will work in that sense that um, how how uh, closely are you able to hit particular outcomes or um, how much influence have you had on making those outcomes occur? I'll keep it broad because it, 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 it really has. I've seen it vary significantly right. from... So I would, the, the way I would uh, have a conversation is I would break this into people, process, and product. 
and I would say, okay, have I been a good people person? Okay, have I have I led? Have I removed blockers? Have I enabled my product teams or not? That would be a piece that you could come up with goals. Okay, have they matured? Okay, on their competency matrix, have they gotten better over time? So that could be a conversation on the people side. On the process could be okay. Have we gotten better with the processes, with product planning and and collaboration and stuff like that? And and on the product, have we impacted on the value side? Would that be a good breakup of how you should have a performance conversation? Yeah, yeah. So if you're talking about um, with my org, I tend to look at different layers. So very similar to um, early on in the conversation there's the people side and there's two layers to that um, which is our ability to hire and our ability to retain and maintain uh, employee well-being so we might have a score attached to that employee engagement sometimes emps our ability to hire great talent um that's one vector the other is um uh around um, uh, our ability to execute on our priorities well uh, and uh, and the process you know what they're doing in terms of the processes they're impacting to to uh, deliver on those priorities that's another layer um, and then uh, I also include um, actually the customer side so looking at um, not just, it's very easy to fall into business metrics, but customer metrics as well is uh, what impact are we having on our customer? How, how are we seeing our CSAT um, slash NPS scores move? So those tend to be the layers that I look at is um, uh, people health, business health, customer health. Excellent. And how do you handle disagreements with your CEO if the CEO and you both see things differently on a on a very on a very important issue? So uh, that's a good question. So one thing is the goals. I see the CEO only, right? So um, uh, they ultimately we we try and have a disagree and commit principle. So ultimately, I see them owning the goals and setting the goals. Um, obviously, we can influence that as an exec team. Um, um, but I, I find that we can move more quickly if we understand who owns something. <laughs> uh, so if they own the goals, that's fine. I can influence it. And uh, if we disagree, that's fine. We can then just commit to it if he's the owner of that. If it's about how we execute on the goals, that's a little different, right? So it might be that yes. certain areas that I own, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then there might be a, dis a disagreement about, well, should we do X or Y? And then once again, I kind of want to move up the stack of the task that we want to do, mm -hmm. the impact it's going to make for the customer, right. the impact and lever that it's going to have for the business, and the goal that we want to hit. Right. I want to make sure we're having the conversation, the right layer. Which layer are we talking about? Right. Feature function, customer impact, right. business impact, or goal. And in each case, address it accordingly. Right. So that's the first thing we want to understand. Where, where are we having this uh, dif difference of opinion? Right. And, the, and who owns it? And what data have we got right. to back, back that up? Because I'd rather data win, right? I'd try and move away from opinion and just say, right. okay, if we think that, what data is telling us this? Okay, let's look into that data. Uh, right. Because that, that then detaches this from being very subjective, opinionated process to having data inform what our next moves might be. Got it. So if it is, if it comes down to opinion and not data, then I think it should be not the highest uh, income person in the room, but it should be the lowest income person in the room because uh, just just to neutralize the power dynamic. <laughs> if, it's, <laughs> if it's your opinion versus yeah. my opinion, then 
let it be the person who is the low, lower income in the in the, the lower <laughs> the, the lipo not the hippo but no, yeah um, lipo, what i would do actually before that ravi what i would do is i would actually ensure we have a framework for how those decisions are made right so for example if there's someone in my team that believes very strongly that the you know in their problem space that this is the problem to solve for and i have a disagreement about that i ask myself who knows this who understands this problem better than better me or them if it's them then i'm going to go for their opinion even if yeah. i have a different opinion i'll, I'll share my opinion i'll right. give it but right. They are talking to these customers every day or whatever it is, how many hours a week, then I would rather that I'd give my feedback and I hope they take it on board, but they should run with that decision. It's the same with other layers. It's like, let's make sure we have a clear understanding of who, let's call it, owns this, right? And if we have that understanding, then it's much easier to move to a disagree and commit approach, right? Um as far as possible, I want data to inform things, but we need to give people the ownership and accountability to run with certain decisions. They, they, they can understand, okay, that's input. I've taken your input, Krish, but ultimately I own this and I'm going to run with it. I'm going to play back my, my, uh, my findings and uh, what I think we should do. Right. But ultimately, I, I want to free them up so they can, they can make the decisions they need to make. Got it. And and sometimes when you're new to the organization or to the industry, um, you definitely lack the information uh, and and the context. And that would only grow over time if you have been really, really rigorous in acquiring this context and knowledge. So initial days when there is a conflict, you would eventually go whoever has the has more information on that given topic right so it's not it's definitely not an ego clash or it's not a function or a, a battle of uh, drawing boundaries right uh, it's not a turf war there so you 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 become neutral and you wear a organization hat company hat and then you say what yeah. is the best for the business and who has the best information and knowledge correct. and you give in to that person correct yeah and uh, and they should be taking full accountability of it right so if if the decision uh, actually led to a good result, share it. If it led to a bad result, share it and share the learnings from it as well. Right. So that's the culture I'd much rather build. Um, let them take ownership because if they don't really feel that sense of ownership and accountability, they're not going to execute as well. Right. If they, they need to believe in what they're doing. Got it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm being mindful of time here. Three three minutes left. I'm just thinking which one should I tackle first. Up uh, on the product discovery side, do you like how do you um, do? Do you have any uh, guidelines on how the teams and the product teams should indulge in product discovery? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm a huge fan of old school speaking to cus. You know, just the the qual research um, again it depends on the stage of the business you're at the earlier in the cycle you are you are at these customer conversations become absolutely crucial to understanding problems and often i find that uh, you can pattern match after typically 10 conversations right within right. double digit conversations you start to see these recurring problems that's one side of uh, this customer discovery that I see as highly impactful and sharing those findings is useful. The second, which is um, not easy, but also really powerful is, is uh, actually tapping into market research and um, uh, doing discovery across the market, not just within a specific uh, problem space um, so that you can unlock um, new areas of growth for the business. And so whether that be bringing in a third party market research company or having that those market research chops in house um, that's useful you know doing putting out uh, quantitative research uh, surveys out there and understanding what the biggest pain points are in the market um, I, I'll, I'll stop there but there are, that, that's again that's probably another one we could deep dive into Ravi Sure. Discovery. Before we leave the last one, and this is, um, I was very curious about this. Um, I, I, I wrote a very passionate um, post a few days ago on uh, 
on expressing ourselves uh, on on social media platforms like linkedin right um, so as 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 anybody who is passionate about their field and profession it's very hard to hold on to you would like to share you like to collaborate you would like to get feedback from yeah. from your peers from your community uh, however as you grow up the ladder in an organization you also are self aware of how you are being perceived in the organization of oversharing what you think coming across so the people the, the best um the best thing most execs resort resort to is to be silent because there is there is mystery in your silence and you don't uh, <laughs> you 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 preserve your uh, that mystery and your aura right just by being non existent on, on social media uh, but that is not me i am naturally somebody who shares everything that is running in my mind and i see that i draw so much inspiration from you that you are able to do that so my question to you is a very sensitive topic how do you manage perception within your company when you are sharing your uh, your opinions your day to day work your product thinking on linkedin prolifically yeah so listen ravi i'm very similar to you i <laughs> just share what's on my mind i prefer to be as transparent as possible um uh because i i find useful conversations come out of it right because i never assume that what i say is is right even by the way i actually often i find that i want people to provoke the thinking and uh and and come up with different points of view and i find as ideas come together and merge you know better ideas come out of it so i'm very much like you i'm really lucky firstly i have to say i work at a company airbase which is uh which has been very supportive quite frankly you know i was able to talk to tejo my the ceo and the pr team and they said yeah go for it no problem uh you know be careful of a couple of things here and there so they've been very supportive um and uh and you know there's a couple of things where they probably told me hey krish maybe maybe don't say so don't be that transparent <laughs> <laughs> okay um <clears throat> and um uh saying all of that i am very very conscious that anything that i say can be taken and used against me and right. and more importantly quite frankly is airbase i don't want to say anything that puts uh, airbase in a in a tenuous position so right. what i'm trying to do when i share is one is partly just share my thoughts share my learnings um <clears throat> i actually want to also share vulnerabilities you know like there are certain things I don't know. And mm. I want to put it out there like it's you know uh there's a perception that I I guess someone in a executive position they they know all they are the all-knowing Iosaurus and know everything, right? Well mm -hmm. that that's not the case. Let's be very clear about that. Um and sh share that. Um but as we discover things because you know one thing is in this space we are all learning. this space is moving so fast by its right. very nature right none of us know everything because exactly. this stuff is changing all the time right. so people really value that feedback and i think good ideas come out from that sharing right. um actually so my team no i say my team everyone at airbase it's funny half the conversations i have with my team come out of those posts they they're actually <laughs> interacting with me in slack and say krish about this post you know actually it's like this and have you thought about blah 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 and like mm. actually that's great <laughs> so uh yeah. ironically those external conversations that i'm having um a third of them i would say turn into internal conversations believe it or not um and and they tend to be quite healthy conversations oh. i find okay what about so should should you ignore everything all the other noise like hey the perception is also important right it's not about whether you are politically correct whether it is damaging the reputation but it's about the perception are you coming across as a smart aleck on social media okay who knows a lot of things and stuff like that um so do you want to also elaborate on that a bit on, on the perception of uh, how you come across as an individual yeah and you talk about internally and externally yes internally more externally internally not... okay internally um internally put it this way ravi i haven't had but bar maybe two cases i haven't had much negative feedback at all internally and again maybe i'm lucky i don't know but um uh i have had uh quite the opposite people telling me 
you know, thank you for sharing kind of your thinking and your thoughts, because again, it's more about the transparency of process, right? Because sometimes I'm just sharing, hey, you know, had a meeting with sales. This is kind of what came on the back of that. Learned quite a few things here. Um, and, and that tends to be appreciated uh, more than anything. Um, so yeah, in, in my case, maybe I'm, maybe I'm an isolated case, but I, I haven't had much pushback at all, actually, internally. So, Again, like so, I say, just a couple of minor cases, uh, to, but that's it. To your credit, to creators like you, to share, to people who share like you, for me, LinkedIn is a place of massive learning. It is, it, it is positioned as a networking professional network space, but it is a learning space. It is a, a bigger learning space than any other training school that you can sign up for. Because I sign up, I follow people like you, um, veterans from, from the space that I want to learn, I follow up. And then the entire field becomes a learning platform for me. And it is because of people like you who share the rest of the world benefits, right? So instead of this perception war, we should be encouraging across organizations. To Absolutely. Make, make this the norm and there should not be even an iota of taboo or people should not be thinking twice, how am I being perceived? What uh, should I share? I share 10 things and I delete eight things immediately because I just I just self, self uh, doubt yeah. myself and second guess myself saying that how, how am I being perceived and stuff like that. So... Uh, but thank you <laughs> for for sharing that. I research. would encourage you to sh to make that not eight you remove. Try and bring it down till it's zero because uh, people really value it, and uh, I think there are probably more people internally that value it than you may realize. Um, and you should let those voices shine. Um, so I would actually stretch the boundaries a little bit uh, because it shows value to. Uh, to your team, to you personally, you gain a lot out of it because I find I'm learning whenever I do this. Uh, half of it's just me learning. Um, and, you know, one side benefit is, okay, a little bit of exposure for your company as well. But I think it's much more about that earnings. Excellent. Well, this brings us to the end of a fascinating conversation with Krishna. We touched upon so many points. We just, I, I, I let my imagination go wild usually. I have a script, but I, the script completely goes uh, goes out of the window, and then I follow my <laughs> instinct and and curiosity as the conversation gets uh, moved into different tangents. But hey, Krishna, thank you for offering your Sunday. One and a half hours is not away from your family time. is is very very appreciated. I would love uh, to to get um, to get this out to lots of young leaders who can benefit from this conversation from your insights. And anybody who wants to reach out to Krishna, he is just just on LinkedIn. He is just look for Krishna Airbase and you will find him. Thanks again, Krishna, for your time. Thank you, Ravi. It's been a great discussion.